Well, it is a joy to gather with you this morning, and we're recording this, and hopefully going to try and get it to everybody, we want all of our members to see it. But let me just sort of go through a history of sort of how we got where we are, and, and then moving into the future, uh, what we hope and plan to do. So, as you know, Buck Run was founded in 1818, uh, and if you go up Georgetown Road towards Georgetown, when you, you get to, uh, I forget the, uh, is that the number of the highway that turns left to go toward, uh, what is it? I can't hear you. No, not, not, not stamping ground. What's the, where the covered bridge is? Schweitzer, thank you. So when you go up the road and you turn left like you can go into Schweitzer right there, the, the little creek comes under the, the uh, highway there, Highway 460, and that's Buck Run Creek. That's Buck Run. A run is a creek. That's redundant to say Buck Run Creek. Uh, and uh, the church was there at uh, where, right on the, on the highway there where the creek goes under the road. Remember, back in uh, the early days of the state of Kentucky, churches uh, almost always had geographical names, usually a body of water, and they had to be built near, near water. You had to have a water source for people to gather, and, and uh, they would typically gather like uh, Buck Run originally, I think, only gathered on one Saturday or a month, because I think John Taylor was doing multiple churches. I think they would gather on Saturday and pretty much go all day long. And members came from all up and down, you know, from toward Georgetown and toward Forks of Elkhorn. Uh, and they, they met there. And uh, when John Taylor became, John Taylor never a, ever accepted the call to be their pastor, but he stayed like 20 years. Uh, and he, he, he did call himself elder which in Baptist uh, ecclesiology is the same thing as pastor or, or overseer. And, he, and the church uh, was there. Uh, you know, uh, the church, when he started uh, Cedar, was that Cedar Grove, Cedar Creek over at Versailles, uh, where he's actually buried now. They actually, you know, in the, there was sort of a great awakening here in, in central Kentucky. I think in... Uh, one December, they baptized like 500 people at that church uh, in Versailles. So Taylor had seen great movements of the Lord and of the Holy Spirit. Yet when he, uh, when he founded Buck Run, he said, his Buck Run will never be large. Uh, he talked about the, the fact that there was a Catholic church right up the road and uh, Forks of Elkhorn and Frankfurt Church is here uh, in Frankfurt. So he, this was always going to be a tiny little country church. But he said, oh, but it's a happy church. And, uh, and so that, that was sort of the plan, be a small uh, and happy church. And in fact, it stayed that way for a lot of years. Uh, I will tell you, but the first two pastors and the last two pastors of this church account for, I, I, don't, I don't know, around 70 or 80 years of, of history. And between the four of us are 73 other pastors. Been a total of 77 pastors. No wonder it stayed small. I don't know about the happy part, but when you have a revolving door of uh, pastors like that over the course of literally centuries, uh, it's hard to grow. So in 1855, they built a, a, the brick building uh, there at Buck Run. Then in 1888, <clears throat> they moved to the Forks of Elkhorn, literally disassembled the building they built in 1855, and uh, with mules and horses and and wagons, they carried that <clears throat> all the <clears throat> excuse me the materials of the building and reassembled it there at the Forks of Elkhorn, and that building was used by this church until we moved here <clears throat> in 2016. So from 1888 until 2016, uh, the Buck Run met there at the Forks of Elkhorn. When Bob Jackson became became pastor for the second time. So he was here twice for a total of 20 years. And the second tenure was a 13-year period from 1990 uh, uh, or about 1999, 2000 till 2000. Uh, I mean, no, I get this right. From 1990 to about 2003. And that's when the remarkable growth occurred. 
uh, and uh, just through an emphasis on prayer and the moving of the Holy Spirit, the church grew uh, incredibly, had multiple services, and uh, Bob felt led to lead the church. They bought the property across the road and built the new sanctuary, what was then the new sanctuary, uh, there in around 1994. And, uh, and so there was a lot of momentum. Tom Rayner wrote his book, Eating the Elephant, a, church, a book on church growth. And there's a chapter in there called The Miracle at Buck Run about the incredible growth that the church <clears throat> had during that period. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1997, disaster strikes. <clears throat> a flood hits and water is in the, the new sanctuary six feet deep, uh, totally muddied. Uh, the church had to meet in the high school for, uh, I'm going to say six months. Am I right on that, Lester? Do you remember? Uh, something like that. And while the church was mudded out, but I will tell you, for everybody, everybody who talks about it, including Bob, uh, when he told me about it, describes it as the momentum killer, that there was incredible momentum. momentum. The church was growing. The flood hit, and it was like, the church lost people and uh, and then and the momentum just stopped and it was hard to get, get it going again once they got back in that building. Uh, it was around then, uh, so once the church gets back in the building, <clears throat> Bob understands that the church is as in a floodplain. Flooding has increased because of increased runoff <clears throat> in uh, from Lexington, South Elkhorn uh, would uh, sort of repeatedly flood. And every time you get a lot of rain in a small amount of time, it just would strike fear in everybody's hearts. And it became obvious that uh, he, he really thought the church needed to move. And so Lester and Buddy Costigan and Bob, I think uh, maybe there was somebody else, but they began to look for a place where the church could move and discovered this 97 acres. And so uh, they, they bought this, I'm gonna say 2001, uh, and with the plan of moving here. And uh, the, Bob was so convinced this was the will of the Lord uh, that they, you know, he proceeded to engage an architect uh, who specialized in churches and the architect came up with some beautiful plans. Uh, and uh, I think the plans, the estimate, or the, the church paid $100,000 for the plans. And the plans were uh, going to cost about, I don't know, between twelve and $14 million. Now, this is around 2001 to 2002 that comes up. And, uh, and then... In 2003, uh, Bob felt led of the Lord to leave Buck Run. And, uh, you know, the church had pretty much bought into the plans, bought into the vision of relocating, and then the key leader leaves. Uh, and I came on the scene, uh, so... The church had, uh, when I arrived in 2003, December of 2003, the church had a $3 million debt. So they had uh, had debt from uh, the building, uh, actually still going back to uh, the fellowship hall, the building, the building, mucking out the building. That was added expense because the church did not have in flood insurance. Uh, and then the purchase of this property, all in, we were in debt about $3 million. And when I came and saw those plans, uh, and I, I, I saw a church that really had a, a great vision for the future, a lot of churches, a lot of, a lot of pastors, I should say, when they go to a church, they're big challenge is to convince the church they need to do something. I was, it was exactly the opposite when I arrived because I was convincing the church we can't do that. And 
I can't tell you the difficulty of that. It was nightmarish on my end uh, because I'm the guy saying, we can't do that. And people are going, hey, where's your faith? You don't have faith. I'm like, you're right. I don't. I don't have, I don't have faith. We're $3 million in debt and we can't, we can't do that. And, you know, we owned a piece of property that was appraised at over $2 million, like $2.3 million. And I was trying every way in the world, man, if we could, if we could sell that, you know, if we could get rid of that debt, get about a million dollars in the bank, we'd be in a good position. Man, it just wasn't happening. I can remember when we made the decision to put the for sale sign in the front yard. Now, I, I can't tell you how difficult that is leading a church that literally is for sale and you're just sort of hoping things will develop, will change. And the whole time there were... <laughs> There were really well-intentioned, godly people in the church that were meeting with me on a fairly regular basis going, you don't have enough faith. And I'm going, yeah, I don't. You're right, I don't. I mean, this, this was a regular conversation that I had. And, uh, yeah, we can't do that. We, we can't do that. Well, you know, uh, if the Lord's in it, yeah, you're right. And if, you know, I'm, I'm with you theoretically, but I just can't lead us to go into more debt. First of all, we couldn't get a loan for that with the debt we already had, it was just a challenge. And, uh, you know, I'm just sort of, uh, let, I'm trying to think of things that will move us forward and, and yet without getting us in too deep. So we, one of the things we did was we said, okay, uh, let's, let's go ahead and do the site prep. And so basically we spent a million dollars moving dirt out here, leveling things off, getting a, a place where we could build uh, a building uh, and uh, that added another million dollars to our debt. We got that for sale sign out there in the front yard hoping to sell the building and there just were no buyers. There were bites every now and then, but everybody knew it was in the floodplain. Here, the challenge was, first of all, for a church to buy it, you, you're moving out of the population center, right? So... To move, it, it, to move out of town, would, that would be a strange thing for a church. To move from Frankfurt out into the, a little place called like the Forks of El, Elkhorn, farther away from where your people live. Uh, secondly, the, everybody knew it flooded, and it would, it would fairly regularly flood. At least our parking lot would go underwater. A few times it got up in the building, never up to the level of the sanctuary floor, but it got in the vestibule. I've got video of... It, about one step below my off, my, the stairs to my office in the back and just totally you know, put our parking lot underwater, bring all kinds of debris up and we push that back out and all kinds of, you know, it was just a, a constant challenge. And so nobody was buying it. No one was, wanted our property and we just had to pay that debt down the old fashioned way and that was our people give to it. And I, I, I was resolved in my heart and mind that I didn't feel comfortable us uh, really starting seriously anything about a move until that debt was taken care of. We, we did a financial campaign, asked our people to give. We did several of those, and uh, we did. We eradicated the debt. It, it took a while, but uh, we got out of debt, and, and then in uh, September, September, I think, of 2012, I stood in the pulpit and I told the congregation my plan that we would be in a new building on this property by Easter of 2017. And I told them, I said, here's what we need to do for that to happen. And it involved, I said, we're going to have a campaign. We're going to ask you to give. Uh, we want to get a million dollars in the bank. And then we, we want to have uh, commitments that as we move forward, uh, we're able to do it. We're going to still try and sell this property. But I, I had lost hope that we would get much for that property. And that was not without reason. We ended up getting only about $300,000 for that property after the bank would not let us take 425000 for it, I think. Uh, and we said, oh, that's a good offer. And they, no, they, you keep trying. And a year or two later, they let us take 300000 So 
uh, it, was, it was frustrating to say the least. Um, I will also tell you there were several things happening in my own personal life. There were a few opportunities that were before me in the early 2000s that I considered taking and uh, the Lord just closed those doors and uh, I, this was to me the Lord saying, no, I, I, I want you to stay right there at Buck Run and get that building built. And that's what, in fact, uh, I, when those doors closed, things that I had contemplated, I, I wouldn't to say I was pursuing them would be way too strong, but I was open if the Lord wanted me to make a move because I knew once we put a spade in the dirt, there was no leaving. I needed to stay here until the thing was built and until it was at least largely paid for. So everything sort of just uh, was confluent, as I say in Romans 8.28. It, it all flowed together. Uh, so beginning uh, in 2012, we got serious about it, and we put together a vision team. I cannot say this enough. Bruce Scott is uh, just, uh, he asked for no praise. He rarely mentioned is mentioned, but I'm going to tell you, Bruce Scott's leadership of our vision team was amazing. Uh, you, I don't think I ever showed the fear on my face that was in my heart, but man, I had it. When you're building a building like that, you, you lead a church to go in debt like that, you just think every bad thought. It's like, what if we build it and nobody likes it? What if we build it and nobody comes? What if we build it and we have a church split and we, we can't pay for it? I mean, you think all of those things, and it is a very fearful time. I didn't even like coming out here on the property. I, it just was, it was muddy and nasty, and, and I was just like, I can't, I'm terrible at envisioning what things are going to look like once they're completed, and I just, I looked at all that mud and gravel, and I thought, this, this will never be right. And I was, I was terrified. Uh, but, man, our vision team and Bruce Scott and our, our pastors, man, Zach Thurman, Adam Bishop, uh, Scott Reeson, and Chris Parrish, all those guys carried burdens beyond any expectation and just were magnificent and did so much. Uh, Jeff Pennington was here when we did our campaign, and I, 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 the Lord has been so faithful to put people around me to make up for my multiple and grave uh, shortcomings, and uh, he's just been so good. And I will say that the church has been absolutely remarkable in her faithfulness and lack of drama. That's just, I, I, I talk to pastors all the time, and they just have non-stop drama in their churches. People just always just getting torn up about this and fussing about that. And at Buck Run, we've been spared that uh, immensely. I mean, to make a move like that, what I characterize as a generational move from the Forks of Elkhorn to here with virtually no dissent. I mean, it was just, it was remarkable. And this building, to me, turned out uh, it, it is everything that we prayed and hoped it would be. Uh, I, I, I love it. I think it's really remarkable that uh, nearly now seven years in, uh, there, there's no major things we go, ah, oh, we blew this. Uh, famously, we made the women's bathroom too, too narrow. Uh, but remember, uh, you can't talk about that. So, uh, so some of you that weren't here need to hear this story. Uh, so I don't know, a few months before we moved in, we realized we made that bathroom too narrow and it would have been an easy fix, but I don't know, somehow it just got by. As you ladies know, if you're the, the, the big woman's bathroom out there, if a woman is washing her hands at the sink and another woman needs to pass by it, it you know, you're, you're bumping stuff. Uh, and, and when we realized that, I thought, oh. You know, that would have been an easy fix to move that wall out another foot. And so at the old building, I got, one Sunday morning, I got up and I said, I need all the women of the church to stand up. And they all stood up and I said, uh, I need to ask your forgiveness. Uh, I've done something against you and I just want you to know I'm very sorry and I'm going to ask your forgiveness. I said, uh, it's hard for me to say this. Of course, everybody's like, what in the world? And I said, we made the women's bathroom too small. 
And I said, will you forgive me? And they all went, yes, we'll forgive you. I said, okay, now that you forgive me, you can't talk about it. Sit down. Uh, and nobody to my, and I made it sound awful, by the way, and compared to what we had over there, right? I mean, the bathrooms over there were, you talk about bumping stuff. You were, you know, there was just, there was no room over there. No room to stand around in fellowship, no room to in and out of the bathrooms, uh, frequently a line between Sunday school and church. And, and so I made it sound so bad that when everybody got out here, you were expecting this little broom closet with a toilet in it. And pe- ladies went in and went, oh that, oh, that sound bad at all. It's like, yeah, thank you. Uh, so the ladies have been wonderful about that. that and frankly, there was a lot of stuff we, we wish we could have afforded. We would have done more if we had more dollars. But with the money we had, I think we nailed it. It's been great. And another unsung hero uh, is uh, Alan Padgett. I just can't say enough about Alan Padgett. Uh, Alan... Uh, I mean, the care he gives this building during COVID, like, you know, during the lockdown, he just repainted everything. He's, well, I'm just going to paint it. And, uh, you know, I worried when we put in these carpet squares, I thought, all oh, those things will curl up at the corners. And I was worried about it. I'm just going to tell you, uh, you know, it, it just looks magnificent. It looks fantastic in many ways, in most ways. It looks as good as it did the day that we moved in, and that's because Alan really takes care of this building. I think we've been really good stewards uh, of the building. Um, And it's just an incredible testimony to the grace of God because I'll just confess to you, uh, if if you choose, honestly, I I think what I do well is what I do right up there every week. If you choose somebody to be your, a pastor who teaches you the word of God, I think I'm your guy. You choose a guy to lead you to build a building, it's like, I'm not your guy. But hey, it's what I had to do. And the Lord just was so faithful. I... I know how weak I am at these things. And I know how remarkably well it went. And there's only one explanation for that. And it's that God gave us the people we needed to do what we did. And it's, it, it will forever be a testimony of God's grace in my heart and my mind. And our folks were just so generous and giving. I know, I know some of our members who just gave, like, retired from the, working for the state of Kentucky, and so they had a pension from the state and then their Social Security, and they gave 100% of their Social Security check to the church and did that for years. Uh, I know several who did that. And people just said, okay, we're going to tighten our belts so we can give. And, you know, all in, this is about a $12 million project we did here. And in April of 2017, when we finally closed the loan, uh, the loan was for $7.2 million. And today, seven years later, uh, the loan is down to, I think as I speak right now, $3,088,000. Um, now, uh, our, an important note is that the, lo- the loan rate is, is fixed only until 2026. And in 2026, it can rise. And that's a big part of wanting to get it paid off because, uh, you know, basically just over 4% interest has been really good in the time. I, I, again, I look, at, I look back at it historically. Had we built earlier, say right before 2008, that would have been financially disastrous. Steel prices back then were like uh, just so exorbitant. So our timing was absolutely perfect. We, if we had known the future, we couldn't have chosen a better time. And the prices were manageable. Uh, interest rates were down. All that has changed now. Uh, inflation and interest rates uh, gone up to, uh, to highs, uh, uh, 30-year highs now. And uh, we currently pay a half a million dollars a, a year out of our budget goes to paying that, down that debt. Now, we've managed that quite well. Like you, you, We don't talk about money much. 
You don't hear us saying, oh man, things are tight and terrible and awful. Uh, but I'll tell you a couple of things. One, the uh, reality is that my salary here has kept other salaries artificially low. And that's, that's, that's been on me. I'm about to be out of the way. Uh, because, because I get a, another salary, uh, the church has paid me incredibly well, but still less than I would if this were my only job and they've not had to pay my insurance. Uh, and so, frankly, that, that's made, made it harder to raise up other guys. I think everybody was a little bit worried about how that would look compared to like paying other people more than me. And uh, so it's artificially squelched the salaries here compared to other churches of our size and budget, and especially when you factor in the incredible uh, skills and gifting of our, uh, of our staff. So uh, we've been able to do well. We've done all right, even though half a million dollars of our budget is just like it just goes straight into paying for this building. You think about it, uh, once that loan is paid off, that frees up an awful lot of money for missions, and to help with the property needs uh, that we're going to continue to have. I want to just point out to you, seven years in, you would not think that seven years in you'd have pretty serious maintenance issues, but guess what? We do. Most of them tech. Uh, Technology is very expensive, and it's also pretty much necessary for what we do, and uh, stuff fails, technology advances, uh, you, you've, you've got to keep up with technology and change and stuff you bought seven years ago, uh, like projectors and all that. You all have noticed we've had issues recently with projectors, with lighting, uh, and several of those things need to be done. And so I want them done while I'm still here. I want that, those changes made. So i have tried to get all that stuff done so I can walk out the door and Chris has as much of a clean slate as possible. So we've got those kinds of things. Frankly, at some point in the future, church probably, you know, my, my plan was uh, for the fellowship hall to be enclosed and turned in, uh, for the pavilion to be enclosed and turned into a fellowship hall uh, where you could even, you can have dinners. You know, we, we really do miss having a full kitchen at the other place. That was the one thing we had that we couldn't afford to put in here yet. But at some point, probably the church will, want that. Uh, Obviously, while you've still got this debt, you can't make other future plans. With 97 acres, Buck Run is well set for the future. And I predict the day will come when a church that believes what this one believes will not be able to get a loan. So frankly, I just think you have to plan uh, to be as independent as possible, to be as self-sustaining as possible. And uh, th- and, and so that's what we're trying to do in being good stewards. So I would really like to see the church pay off that loan in three years so we are out of debt, and that sets us up financially to handle maintenance on the building, meet future building needs, uh, whatever is needed. Uh, and though we did not cut our missions giving, we did more or less freeze it. Uh, at, at the pre-building levels. So we moved from a percentage being given to the cooperative program that we just took what we had given that previous year, which was, I think, $156,000. And we said, okay, that's what we're going to give for the foreseeable future. It's still far above the average Southern Baptist church, uh, or even percentage-wise. But it's, it's frozen that missions giving at that amount uh, because we think we need to knock off the debt and uh, it's not good to pay interest any more than you must. So I would really, really like us to have a, a, a campaign in which we're just asking every member to take your next step in generosity and stewardship toward the church. Now, I want to be clear that some of you have been doing this for years and years. Um, I, I, I won't call a name, but I remember 
meeting with one couple when we first started our first building campaign to move out here in 2012, 2013. And this particular couple said, look, we've been at Buck Run X number of years. We've been in every one of these campaigns and we're planning on doing that till we die. They said, we just, we know that the Lord's work will always require resources. And that's just part of our family's uh, commitment is that we're, we're going to give uh, over and above our tithe to Buck Run. Man, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that spirit and that attitude. So I would tell you that our, we really, really ask every single member to be faithful in your regular giving. So we, we need our folks to tithe. I'm not, a, I'm not legalistic when it comes to believing in the tithe. I, I, I don't think God is going to zap you or, you know, if you don't pay your tithe, that somehow he's going he's gonna to make your car break down and it's going to cost the same thing your tithe would have been. I, I'm, you don't hear those stories from me. Here's what you hear. I, it is clear in the Old Testament that tithing was the principle uh, for God's people. And I cannot imagine that under grace, we should do less than what God's people did under the law. So it's not a legalistic, I don't do it out of fear. I, I do it out of desire. But Tanya and I, man, when we were flat busted broke in Memphis, you know, in the Memphis area when I went to seminary, and someone, I can't tell you how God would raise up people to give us $500, which 1987 broke and in seminary, $500 was like 5000 It was a lot of money. But man, we tithed it. We, we, we always, we just said, man, the Lord's been faithful. Why would I not give the tithe? And we've tried to be faithful in giving uh, to the church uh, a, as a tithe. So I, I believe that that's a great principle. It's a great gauge because it's proportional. And whether you make a very little or a lot, it teaches you, first of all, to live on less than you make. That's an important skill to have in life. You, you need that discipline. You need that skill. Secondly, it teaches you to be generous. And that really is the point of using what God has given us. This is what Paul teaches in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is the spirit of generosity. Uh, that God's people should be generous. God loves a cheerful giver. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So th this, is, this is really uh, without any dispute biblically that we ought to be generous and givers. I think a tithe is a good guideline. Uh, so we want you to continue your regular giving to the church. And if you are not doing it, we want you to start uh, because we really do believe that we should have a proportional giving. We should all shoulder our, uh, our uh, percentage, if you will, of the burden. And if we all do based on what God has given us, I think that comes out really well. And so as we begin this advance campaign, uh, we, we want, we're asking every individual or family to pray and seek the Lord and see what God can do through you over the next three years. And we're asking you to give, uh, to make a commitment above your regular giving, above your, your tithe. And, uh, you know, I, I fear that as we're reaching a lot, of, a lot of younger families that haven't been taught tithing aren't doing it. We really want to help people be intentional and regular in your giving and also sacrificial. Uh, that we should be giving in a way that it, it, you know, David said, I won't offer to the Lord that which cost me nothing. And we really don't want to be in the mentality that we're giving God our leftovers. But... Uh, we need to make sure that we're giving the Lord, really, uh, I just think a principle for a Christian is you give the Lord your first, your first minutes of the day, uh, uh, your, your uh, first part of your income. Uh, uh, you just look and see how can I give the Lord my first and my best. We give him the first day of our week. 
this is, I think, what you see. The pattern in the scripture is that we're, we're to give God our first and our best. And we should do that in our finances. But I'm asking you to go even beyond that and to give uh, sacrificially. Now, this is challenging because it just doesn't have the same excitement as when you're saying, oh, let's advance into the future in a building we don't have yet and it's something we haven't built yet. People are really excited. What we're doing is saying, hey, we love this building, now let's pay it off. It doesn't have quite the same thrill and excitement, but it is every bit as much the will of God and necessary to carrying out the task of the kingdom. I'm going to ask our ushers to pass out something to you, and I want you to look at that. Uh, it, and everybody going to get a copy of this. This is just sort of showing you how our advanced campaign works. So they're going to pass this out, and, and when you get that, I want you to take a look inside at the, there's a little chart there that says Pathway to $2 million. And I want you to take a look at that. It tells you in order to reach, if we, if we reach $2 million, we're paying half a million out of our, our budget what is the regular tithes and offerings that are coming in, we've budgeted out of that half a million a year. If we can raise another $2 million over the next three years, along with what we're paying in our budget, that debt will be erased. And we really want that to happen before we have to renegotiate that loan and also before, really before the 10th anniversary of this building. And just think about the flexibility that we'll have when we are free from debt, when we're not paying interest, the agile footing we'll have to be able to serve our community, to do a greater task with missionaries. This is why we, we want to get rid of the debt. We just don't want that just dangling out there for years and years. Now look at that chart, and that chart tells you that we would, we need, if we could have one person give us basically a $300,000 gift, and one person give us a $156,000 gift, if two people would give, or two families would give $78,000, if two families would give forty six. dollars thousand and eight hundred dollars we just got it down there if we had this many giving units give these amounts and it breaks it down what that would be weekly and monthly and annually we could reach two million dollars the question is what do we have to do to advance the gospel well that's what we have to do to pay this off, to get rid of the debt, to be free uh, in order to then use all of our resources. Can you imagine a $500,000 a year infusion into our mission and our ministry that we'll have when that debt's taken care of? Now, when you look at that chart, I know something about you. You know what I know? I know that your eye has fallen on a place. And you have said to yourself, hmm, that's what we could do. What I'm asking you to do is let your eye fall in a place where you say, that's what God can do. We need to do more than what we can do. We need to do what God can do. Now, here at Buck Run, uh, I've been here 20 years. I don't think anybody's ever accused me of being high pressure when it comes to money, and I'm not about to start that on the way out. We call this a commitment. Notice I'm not using the word vow. I'm not using the word pledge. When I say commitment, I'm talking about your intention 
to give. Your circumstances could change. The economy could change. A lot of things could happen over the course of the next three years. Uh, nobody is going to shame you. No one's going to act disappointed in you. Uh, we will probably send out statements from time to time just to remind you, here's what your commitment was. Here's what you've given thus far. But I want you to know something. I have never once ever in nearly 20 years that I've been here, I've never looked at what anybody gives. I've never, you know, two reasons. One, I don't want to be disappointed in people and I don't want to feel obligated to people, either one. So if somebody gives far, far more than anybody else, I don't want to feel like, oh, I got I to gotta pay that guy special attention because he's a main gift. I just don't play that game. Nor do I want to feel disappointed in people because uh, I think they ought to be giving more. I, I just, it's not that I don't think uh, it's right for me to look. I just don't want to. And only our treasurer, our business manager, they're the only ones that have access to this data. And they just help, they will help you know what you've given. But there's just, there is no push there other than that. Uh, there, you're never going to be shamed. You're never going to be made to feel guilty. This is, I'm asking you to, to come up with what you think God can do through you. I'm asking you to be creative. I want you to think what, first of all, what can you give up? How can you save by not spending on certain things? Can you cut out eating out? Can you cut out some other thing that you regularly spend money on? That you don't have to do that. You can give that to the Lord. Uh, can you uh, liquidate? Is there something you can sell? Property, cars, uh, antiques, whatever. Look and see. What can you liquidate? What can you generate? Can you do? Can you do extra work? Is there something you can do to make money that you designate completely to the advance campaign? What can you eradicate? What are things you can cut out the, so that you save money? I, I really do believe we can be creative. Remember the parable of the talents where the master gave to his servants different numbers of talents. And what did they do? They... They took what he gave them and they made more to give back. What investment can you make or sell in order to do this? By the way, just so you know, we can receive, uh, we can receive uh, stocks, we can receive property. There are a lot of things, ways that you can give. You can talk to Scott about those things, but what I'm asking you to do is between now and November the 5th, I, I want you to come up with, in, in your family, uh, if you're a family, I want you to talk about it, include your kids. If you're a couple, I want you to talk about it and pray about it together. If you're single, I want you to get before the Lord and ask. But on November the 5th, we're, going, we're asking every member of Buckron to make a commitment of what you purpose in your heart to be able to give over the course of the next three years. And we're furthermore asking you to, if, if possible, to give at least 10% of that commitment on November the 5th in what we call a first fruits offering. Now, you may not be able to. You might have something that's going to take longer than that. That's fine. Do what you can. But on November the 5th, we want to make our commitments and we want to do our first fruits offering. Remember, your commitment is your intention, your desire. It's what you're trusting God for and what you will try your best to fulfill. It's not a vow. It's not a pledge. Your circumstances might change, but this is your serious intention. God being your helper, this is what you're purposing in your heart to give. Make it about what you do as a family, what you do as a couple, what you do as a single person and do it as unto the Lord. And I just know that 
First of all, we have everything we need for life and godliness. I think this is a godly purpose and a godly pursuit. I think God has given us the resources we need. Uh, this is, I just trust him for that. And I'm asking you to be all in. And just so you know, I mean, uh, Tanya and I are at a place in our lives right now where, man, we aren't sure. We're not sure what the Lord has in store for us. But God being our helper, man, we're committed to Buck Run. Uh, it, Buck Run is in our will. That, that's not going to change as long as Buck Run preaches the gospel. And part of, by the way, our transition plan was that this is, I think, the best way to ensure that Buck Run continues to preach the gospel and to stand for what it stands for right now. The fact that your next pastor is somebody you already know, you know his doctrinal commitments, you know his walk with the Lord, you know his family, you know his leadership style, all that. And I just think we are remarkably well positioned for the future. And this is a key piece of it to have maximum freedom for the future uh, and to preserve the unity, integrity, financial accountability of the church. I think this is what needs to happen. Tanya and I, if, unless the Lord absolutely moves us, uh, we intend to leave our membership here. Uh, I won't be around much. I will tell you this, my, my 2024 is already almost completely booked. And I'm going to be, it's going to be different preaching a different place every week. I think the big challenge for me is not preaching to the same people every week. That's going to be hard for me and not being able to walk through, you know, a book like I do. Uh, but I really want to be a blessing to pastors and to churches. And so this is the right and the next step for me. But Buck Run, our plan is for Buck Run to be home base. And uh, you show up here, you know, at Christmas and whenever you see us and uh, I, I, you know, I'm still going to call on you. You know, Greg Stacy will still get a call from me when I need plumbing done. Uh, you know, I'm, some things you just can't get out of, but we're committed to this. We're making a commitment and God being our helper, we want to fulfill that. So on the side, on the inside of the page, there are some questions uh, that I believe I think I have covered. Um, and it's your, your commitment cards are going to be mailed to you. And each family is going to have the opportunity to make your commitment at home and then bring your commitment card on November the 5th uh, and turn those in as we make our first fruits offering. And I think it's just a... It's a burden on my heart. I want to finish well. I want to leave the church in a great position. I think this is part of my stewardship of, of being your pastor for the last 20 years and asking you to do this. I think uh, it's the timing is right. The methodology is right uh, because, frankly, it has to come from really from your heart. If it... If I can talk you into something, somebody else can talk you out of it. But if it comes from your heart because you got with the Lord and you purposed in your heart what you think God can do through you, what you're trusting him for, then I think the Lord's going to receive the glory from that. 